So, good afternoon. Uh, we're going to have a talk. This uh, session will start with Professor Xiao Zhang uh, talking about modeling electrolyte materials with atomistic machine learning. Uh, Xiao Zhang is senior lecturer at the Department of Chemistry from the Angstrom Laboratory at the Uppsala University working uh, in the structural chemistry. He has developed new machine learning tools applied to electrochemist devices, as well as scale modeling of electrolyte materials and stud zone solid leak interface for energy storage. Professor Charles Sang has more than uh, 700 citations and age index of 16. Uh, 23 published papers. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have here with, uh, with us, Professor Shaozang. Thank you for, and the screen is yours. You can start. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Luciano. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to give uh, this lecture uh, in this uh, workshop. So I will first to start uh, share my presentation. So I think uh, it looks good, huh? Nice, good. All right. Yes, so the, the title of my presentation is uh, the modeling of electrochemical systems with uh, atomistic uh, machine learning. Uh, so this is uh, about uh, uh, our uh, activities in this new direction in the past uh, uh, couple of years. So, uh, so before we talk about the modeling, right? So what is actually electrochemical system? Uh, all right. So uh, according to uh, Schmickler in his book, uh, Inter Interfacial Electrochemistry, so electrochemistry is dealing with interface between an electronic conductor, which is an electrode, and the ionic conductor, which is an electrolyte. Uh, and therefore, of course, the, the electrified interface plays a very important role in electrochemical energy storage devices, such as the supercapacitors, as well as the batteries. Um, but nevertheless, the electrolyte is also very important because uh, the, its uh, uh, transport properties, as well as uh, its uh, chemical and electrochemical stability is crucial for the performance and also the safety of all these uh, uh, devices. And then uh, when it comes to modeling, usually we start with this uh, multi-skill modeling letter, which you might actually have seen before. So for very small scale, which you go to, let's say, the femtoseconds and the one, nano, one Ohmstrom, then we can actually do very accurate uh, calculation with uh, quantum mechanics. And then you, if you start actually to look at a bigger system and uh, a bit longer time scale, then the electrons is going to be taken out. And you start describing interactions between your atoms and uh, in molecules and in materials by so-called mechanic, molecular mechanics. And uh, this actually can give you some uh, structure information and the conformational changes, for example. And if you want to actually uh, propose uh, larger systems and look at, for example, phase transitions and the morphology uh, evolutions, and then you might actually want even coarse grained your atom. So if you do sort of like meso skilled modeling, and then eventually uh, the whole system will be described just by grades and uh, and uh, the fields, and then what you have is. Uh, is a kind of continuous description of your system. So with that said, so the, the challenge in the multi scale modeling is that we only have a reliable model at the micro scale, but we are interested in modeling some macro scale phenomenon. And, uh, and also we know that we can do very accurate calculation for very small system, but if you want to do larger system, is simply too expensive, right, for practical uh, uses. Therefore, the idea is that can we actually develop model or algorithm 
which can effectively capture the, the larger scale, but only using the input from the, the microscopic models. So there are basically two fashions at this moment. So one is called uh, the concurrent model. So here is uh, an enzyme with uh, a catalytic uh, pocket. So you have some reactions which happen in this uh, uh, pocket, and uh, which means you have to treat this small area with uh, quantum mechanic calculation. And then the rest of the enzyme can be described by, for example, molecular mechanics with point charge. And uh, so this is sort of uh, QMM, QM and MM methods is uh, the, the leading model in this concurrent uh, multi-scale modeling. And because of that, the inventors of these methods uh, were given the Nobel Prize in chemistry back to 2013. And, uh, and then this, the other fashion is to call the uh, sequential model, where we will actually do the reference calculation for relative small system using the first principles. And once we have that, we can devise a more approximate uh, form to describe interactions between the atoms and molecules using so-called the force field, right? You have the, for example, the harmonic uh, spring to describe the stretching, and then you have other similar terms to describe the, the, the bending and the torsional angle, and there, as well as uh, non-bonded non uh, interactions. And then what actually machine learning can do for the multi-scale modeling? And uh, then the first I crash questions before that is actually, so what is actually machine learning? So machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence with a goal to learn from the data. So according to, the, to Arthur Samuel, uh, who coined this term, uh, the machine learning is a field where to study uh, to give the computer actually the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So in terms of for, for the deep learning people, it is means uh, the programming instead of uh, uh, showing instead of programming. And uh, so if you, if you just check uh, about machine learning and chemistry, there is actually quite a number of uh, publications. And uh, so here I just take a few recent review and uh, perspective papers, which appears in, in very high profile journals. And if you, it's also ev evidenced by the number of publications, which includes the keywords of machine learning and uh, chemistry. You can see that this just goes up uh, ex exponentially. So uh, what can machine learning do for multi-scale modeling? So we know that uh, we can do very accurate accurate uh, uh, first principle calculation, but it's very expensive on the other hand. And we can also do force field based calculation, which we can handle larger system, but however, the accuracy is not so good and mostly we cannot do any reactions. So therefore what machine learning try to offer is a kind of a sweet pot between the first principle and the force field based calculations. And specifically, we know that if you're interested in, let's say, modeling biological system, you can use like amber charms and Gromos force field. And they are quite good actually to handle like a polymeric materials. And then uh, if you want to do reactions, in, then for the solid state materials, you can use so called the Tersov, the embedded atom model, or Rex, which can actually give you the phase transitions and, uh, and for example, the ion migrations. In, in the solid systems. Uh, and uh, however, this sort of uh, reactive force field is, uh, uh, is devised specifically for a particular system. Therefore, it might not be so transferable, right, for another system. And also, uh, the accuracy could be also be an issue. And in fact, if you look at uh, people who are working with the small, like say, water clusters, they can make very accurate potentially any surface. And therefore, I think what uh, a machine learning potential try to offer is sort of intersection between these uh, three desired features. So the transferabilities, the accuracy, as well as with, uh, reactivities. So to make it more concrete, I will make, give an example which uh, from our work. 
So that is about uh, the aqueous alkaline electrolyte. So this is uh, this aqueous uh, alkaline electrolyte, such as uh, lithium hydroxide, uh, potassium hydroxide, and uh, sodium hydroxide. So uh, they are used for the nickel uh, cadmium batteries. So this is sort of uh, old fashioned battery, not very environmental friendly, but it is very stable. So it's still actually produced and used for, for example, in the car starters. And uh, so the story is that, uh, uh, so uh, in Uppsala, so the, the university innovation office, they organized the event which is called the AIM Day. So I was in this AIM Day back to uh, 2017. So I was sitting in the room where there is the engineers from the Zaft, which is a battery company. So they produce this uh, nickel cadmium batteries. So they come to the university and they try to bring some questions, which they thought the university researcher might actually have a solution. So the question they ask is, uh, can you actually measure or simulate the ionic conductivities for this uh, kind of uh, equals electrolyte? Because this is a sort of a very established batteries. The only thing they can optimize is actually the ionic conductivity. So I was sitting with my Swedish colleague and, uh, and they, they were experimentalists. Uh, so they said, well, yeah, sure, we can measure the ionic conductivity. So I was the only theoretician actually in the room. So to defense the, our pride, so I said, of course, we can also simulate the same thing. But uh, what I didn't tell them is that this is actually quite difficult because uh, the transportation of the OH miners, the hydroxide ions, is actually involved the change of the chemical bond and the hydrogen bond during the transportation which means you really have to describe the, the reactive dynamics in order to capture the ionic conductivity for this system. So let's just look back about what people have done actually about simulating the hydroxide ions. So the first, the, the DFTMD, so the density of functional theory based market dynamic simulation uh, came into the scene in 2002. So you can see the system is just 31 water molecules plus one OH minus. And the, the system was uh, described by the bleep functional. And, uh, and, the, and the simulation was actually the CPMD, the Carbonello market dynamics for eight picoseconds. So within that time scale, the authors uh, were able to look at the structure and the sum dynamics of such a system. So, but this, this is like 20 years ago, right? And it's still quite impressive back then. And then if you look at more recent literature, so here is one. So the, this group of authors, they were able actually to use a CPD simulation to study 63 water molecules plus one OH minus, right? But now with this increased computational power, you can do hybrid functionals rather than just the GTAs, like the functional. And uh, so you can do 50, uh, 45 picoseconds, which allows you to look at the dynamics and the, the diffusion. That's why if you look at the title, the title is actually try to figure out why the hydroxide diffuse slower compared to the hydronium in the water solution. And then uh, last year, well, ex yeah, exactly. So together with, uh, uh, Matty Hedstrom and also Yuga Beller. So uh, we were able actually to using the neural network potential to invest the system of the uh, sodium hydroxide system at different concentrations. And with this uh, technique, we are able to actually to carry out simulations at each temperature and each chemical compositions for 50 nanoseconds. And this allows us not just look at diffusion, but really to compute ionic conductivity. So ionic conductivity is a, a collective property, which means you really need long time skill in order to converge the computation. So with the machine learning potential, we can do the reactions, right? You can really simulate the proton transfer in the sodium hydroxide uh, solution. And then as you, I, as you can see from the, from the top panel, on the right. So this is the comparison between the simulation and also the experiment, which we did ourselves. And uh, this is really actually come out nicely because uh, the simulation involved no input, right, from the experiment. You can see that 
we were able to capture both the concentration as well as the temperature dependence using the simulation without actually input any input from the experiment. And uh, one of the surprises actually from the simulation is that uh, you know that there are actually two types of uh, conductivities. So one is called uh, the Nernst-Einstein, right? Which is uh, a conversion between the diffusion to the conductivity. And the other one is called the green couple conductivity, which includes the ion-ion correlations. And one of the surprises we find actually from this simulation is that these two conductivity are actually quite close to each other. Because usually, if you come to your talk to your experiment colleagues, work with the electrolyte, they will see that if you're increasing the ion concentration, there will be ion pairings, there will be ion clusters, but that, which means there should be a difference between the Nernst Einstein and the Green Cooper conductivity. But this is not what we see in the simulation. And of course, this really triggers us to figure out why. And, uh, but this is not what I'm going to tell you actually uh, for this talk. So in the work which I just showed, the technique which we used is called atomic neural network. So what is atomic neural network? So this is a, a class of machine learning method. So the idea is to devise deep neural nets to predict properties based on the structure information, such as uh, the atomic number and the atomic coordinates. So the, the ANNs has been very successful in predicting uh, physical chemical properties such as electrochemical stability window, as well as uh, the, to approximate the potential energy surface as examples, which I just showed. And then there are actually a few uh, requirements in order to actually make a good uh, uh, ANNs. So the first one is that uh, you need to make sure that uh, your atomic neural network is translational, rotational, and the permutational environment respect to the inputs. And we'll come to that in a moment. And suppose that the, you can actually satisfy these symmetry requirements. Then you also need to make sure that your description right, of the local chemical environment is unique. So what does it mean? So if you look at these two tetrahedrons, which show on the, on the left, so these two tetrahedrons have exactly the same bound distance, right? But these actually are two different tetrahedrons. And what does it mean? It means if you use the bound distance as the, the descriptor in your machine learning model, you are not able to dis differentiate these two configurations. In other words, your descriptor is not unique. So this is something which one has to be taken into account. We actually make a good descriptors. And then suppose that you have a good descriptor which is uh, satisfied the symmetry requirement and also unique, then you will also want that your machine learning model is scalable, which means if you make, for example, a model to describe water cluster, then you would like this also work for the backwater, right? We actually increase in the number of water molecules. And this is not necessarily the case, depending on how you actually devise your model. And then suppose that your model is actually scalable, then you would also like to have the dynamics, right, in the simulation, which means your machine learning model should also be differentiable, right, to, for example, the nuclear coordinates. And in the end, you would like also to have that your machine learning model to be generalizable, which means it's not just one, you know, one machine learning model for one kind of elements. You would like to, to able to the, the model to able to describe actually for different elements. So uh, now let's take a, a step back to look at the, what actually is the development of ANNs. So uh, before 2000, people already start actually to think about how to actually describe, for example, the intermolecular potential by using neural networks. For example, to describe the, this water cluster, you have this uh, water dimer with uh, uh, aluminum ions, for example. And then they already encounter one of the issues as following. So if you look at one water molecule, right? It's of course have one uh, oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. So for example, if you make a machine learning potential using this kind of 
input geometry. And uh, once you're happy with your fitting, then if I tell you that, if you swap the coordinates of the first and second hydrogen atoms, then can you actually still be recognized by your machine learning model if you're just using the, the bound distance as input? So if you do it naively, it wouldn't work. Because if you swap actually these two uh, coordinates, you will have a different input, right? Then for the machine, of course, it means a different molecule. Of course, physically they are the same. Which means you have to do something additionally in order to make the machine learning model uh, indifference, right, to the permutation of uh, the same type of atoms. And for example, what you can do is you can just make a, right, a sum of these uh, two bound distance. And this actually can be used as a new coordinate and which you can use in your machine learning model. So this is called the symmetry functions. So which means if you use, for example, the internal coordinate, like the bound distance and the angles, this actually are rotational translational environment. And then by making these symmetry functions, it will also make a descriptor permutational environment. However, back then, all this kind of uh, machine learning potential was actually only made for specific systems. For example, if you do for two water uh, dimer, right, water dimer, you cannot actually add more water, which means that the, this kind of architecture is not scalable. And then in 2007, so uh, Yuki Baylor and Michele Palinello, they made this uh, landmark paper, which is uh, to give this so-called the Baylor Palinello neural network. So the key idea, what they made is that uh, they say, okay, let's take this on that, saying that the total energy of the system can be, uh, can be uh, break down into the atomic energies of each atom. And then you can use a neural network to describe each atomic energy. And once you sum this up, you will get your total energy. The nice thing of this uh, seemingly simple step is that now if you have a new, for example, water molecule, you can just add it, right, using the old network. And then the system becomes scalable. In other words, by doing this uh, uh, on that, saying that the total energy is actually is the summation of atomic energy, you transform these global problems into a local uh, descriptor problem. And, uh, and also in that paper, uh, they actually devised so-called the BP symmetry functions, which looks like the following. Um, the nice thing of this uh, BP symmetry function is that it can be actually tuned according to the specific chemical system you're looking at. But then on the other hand, it's also a very painful process because it's, you might actually spend a year actually just tuning the symmetry function. And not only that, as you can see from this format of a symmetry function, it depends on you know, the bound distance between a pair of uh, elements or atoms. And also, for example, if you have the, this G2 symmetry function, it actually involves three atoms. And uh, then you can see that the number of symmetry function will grow exponentially if you increase in the number of elements. So this is another thing which uh, sort of uh, uh, limits the application of the BPNN. And then in 2016, two groups in US, so one is from uh, for, is uh, VG Pandai, the groups, another is Alan Asprook Guzik's group. So they came up with this idea almost at the same times. Because in that time, uh, the most popular uh, deep learning architecture is uh, this so called convolutional neural network. So their idea is see that can we actually use this uh, very impressive uh, architecture from the deep learning and apply for the molecular and material system by taking the atom as a node and then the bound as the, the edge, as in a graph, right? So that was actually their, uh, their initial ideas. So the, this graph convolutional neural network or GCNN have some uh, quite uh, some uh, number of nice features. For example, it have this so-called weight sharing between the subnet, which means all these atoms they would describe by exactly the same net, 
which means if you add sort of new type of atoms, it you wouldn't need actually to change the weight. And, uh, and also, uh, by doing this sort of a convolution step, you will generate the feature automatically without this handcrafted uh, symmetry function. So this is, of course, uh, will save uh, a lot of uh, effort. But nevertheless, one of the uh, issues with, uh, with GCNA is that it's about this uniqueness of the, the descriptors. Uh, so there is no actual proof saying that the descriptor generate from the uh, GCN will be unique. However, according to the practice, what we find is that uh, the descriptor is actually uh, over complete. So this then is bring me to a very important topic, which is uh, how one should actually represent the local chemical environment, right? As a, as a computational chemist. So there are a few different uh, fashions. So the first one is uh, you can do this uh, uh, so-called many uh, body potential inspired representations, such as uh, the symmetry function. And uh, in these sort of fashions, it's, uh, it's like you make a, a classical force field. You will have terms which describe the bounds. You have the terms which describe the angle and, to and torsional, for example. But it's not as simple as uh, the classical force field looks like, but the spirit is a bit similar. And then the second fashion is to make a descriptor based on atomic density. And uh, the nice thing of atomic density is it's very sensitive to the change of local environment. But then the issue is that atomic density is not really translational or rotational environment. So you have to take this step to make it uh, symmetralized. If you do that, you will get something like a smooth overlap of, of, of atomic position, of the soap descriptor, and also like uh, atomic cluster expansion, as well as a tensor product of the, the two body descriptors. And then what people realized recently is that uh, uh, these two kind of fashions, they are connected. So you actually can generate your many body uh, representation by projecting atomic density based description into specific basis set. And then there are the third fashion, which is the, the descriptor generate from the graph convolutional neural network. So here I try to explain what is that. So the way how the GCNN generate the descriptor is through two uh, steps or two actually operations. The first operation is called the PI. It's called the, the pairwise interaction. And the second is called IP. This is called interaction pooling. So let me try to explain. So if you look at this uh, uh, scheme, you will get your input, right? Which is uh, atomic coordinate and the topping number. And then you are passing some neural network layers. And this neural network layers operation is actually to generate this pairwise interaction. So the input is you have a feature vector for each atom. And also it's taking into account the radial distributions, which reflect by the Rig, which is bound distance. So if you put them together in a specific way, you would be able to generate this uh, uh, pairwise interaction. And then once you have that, you will actually do so-called interaction pooling which essentially try to group, right, all this pairwise interaction into a specific atom. And this, once it's complete, uh, completed, you will have a new, right, uh, node feature, which is PI. You can see that what is changing here is this T as a, uh, as a superscript, which means this step is actually will do in iterations. So after a few iterations, you will actually generate a good uh, descriptors. So, so I, I, I was mentioning this uh, pairwise interaction, right? But, uh, but you shouldn't uh, uh, get confused saying that this pairwise interaction is actually a two-body interaction. In fact, it is a multi-body interaction. So why it, it, it is like that? So let me use this water molecule as an example. So suppose your input is just a water molecule, right? The first step is you're going to translate this water molecule into a graph, which means you're going to replace the atom with a node, and then the bound with a, a specific pairwise interaction. 
And then at the first step, during the graph convolution uh, iterations, you can see that this pairwise interaction is indeed a two-body function, right? You have, you have this sort of uh, uh, a schematic uh, picture showing here. But after this PI and MP interaction, then in the next iteration, when t equal to one, you can see now this pairwise interaction, sorry, this, uh, yes, this pairwise interaction is no longer a two-body function. It in fact is a three-body function already, which means through these CG iterations, you will actually generate multi-body representation. So this is actually a key idea in the GCN. And then what we did is uh, we actually uh, uh, made our own code, which is called the ping, and we implement this uh, GCN architecture, which is called PyNite, together with this uh, traditional uh, better pinado neural network. So both actually are implemented in our code pin. And so this code is uh, based on the TensorFlow and uh, so it's freely used and also you can actually find the tutorials on our GitHub. So, uh, so our uh, ping is actually can work for both predicting, predicting uh, potentials and also actually to predict the properties such as the dipole and charge as I will show you in a moment. So specifically in Ping, uh, we implement and designed this uh, new, uh, we call it physics inspired uh, GCN, which is PyNite. So the architecture of the PyNite is a bit different from other GCN, for example, like Schneid, which if you, if you are aware. So for example, in Schneid, uh, you would have so-called a, a filter. So a filter is sort of like a Gaussian function, which gives you the, the radio distribution. And then you try to apply this, uh, uh, this Gaussian function into different atoms. This is a so-called convolution step. And then in ping, in PyNite, what we did is uh, something different. So we know that uh, this ratio distribution function should also depend on both nodes, right? Depends should both on i and j between a pair of uh, atoms. So which means we will actually not have a filter, but instead we have actually a weight matrix. And this weight matrix actually depends on both nodes PI and PJ. And which means by making the matrix product with our uh, radio function, we are able to have a, a, a pairwise interaction which have different ratio uh, radio distribution. And this actually will be more uh, physical because uh, we know that the interactions between a pair of atoms should actually depend on the node feature of both nodes, right? And so how actually PyNite uh, performs compared to our peers? So this is a, a comparison for different data sets of both molecules and also the crystalline materials. So here I'm showing you the, the mean absolute error, which is a way to quantify the accuracy of the model. As you can see, for PyNet compared to uh, other GCAN architecture, it is actually is high performing and quite competitive. And uh, here is uh, uh, another picture which shows how the learning curve looks like. So the learning curve is, uh, is showing how the accuracy, right? reflect as uh, the mean absolute error uh, skills with the, the, the number of training data points. And as you can see, for PyNet, it has a quite nice slope compared to other different descriptors. We know that one of the, uh, the drawback or something which uh, people usually blame to the deep learning model is saying that, yes, you might actually have a good number, but you don't know how, why it is actually worked. And uh, this is the, uh, something nice feature from uh, the PyNet is that we actually can visualize the node and edge features. And here I want to bring your attention to the, to the right panel. So on the right, what I'm showing you is uh, how the edge feature and the node feature looks like in three independent trained neural network models for the for predicting for, uh, for predicting the same molecules which is the two three dimensional foreign molecules 
So you can see uh, we have this uh, edge feature, which is uh, showing sort of like a bound. But you can see this is really different, right? According to different uh, neural, ne neural network models. So if you're a chemist like me, then I will make a guess which model actually makes more sense to me. Then I might see that actually the first model looks better because I can see this sort of activation of the edge feature looks resembles more like a chemical bond compared to other cases. And what is nice is that if you look at the prediction of the energy, which is here showing the delta mu zero, respect to the reference, then you can see that this model, which seems follow our chemical intuition, is also the model which have the, the highest accuracy. In other words, the pinite does not only give you a good performance, but also actually it's, uh, expon ex ex it is also explainable, which means it actually can follow, can tell uh, the good performance actually also follow the good chemical intuition. So, so far, uh, what I show you, right, in the example of the hydroxide, that is about uh, the machine learning potential. But as I said, you can also use uh, exactly the same neural network architecture to make the property predictions. And the example which I'm showing here is about uh, to pre predicting the dipoles and the charges. We know that the charge is actually important because it's reflection of the chemical reactivities and also a proxy for the oxidation states, for example. And also, if you're interested in electrolyte, uh, we may actually converting the diffusion coefficient to the conductivity. We would also need to know actually what would be the atomic charge. And so what we did is we take this uh, QM9 data set, which is uh, a small mo organic molecule data set, and try to see uh, what can we do with the pinite for predicting dipole and charge. So here I'm showing two kind of uh, atomic dipole models you can make for predicting this, uh, for use uh, predicting the dipole movement of QM9 data set. So the first one is called atomic dipole. So you can see the atomic dipole mod uh, model is that you just treat your molecular dipole moment as a summation of atomic dipole. This is exactly as what you do with the energy, right? Because you know that in the energy, we just do say that the total energy is the summation of atomic energy. So if you just do this brute uh, forcefully, this could be what you try. And then the second one is more physical. We know that the dipole is the so-called the coulomb meter, right? So it's actually the charge times the, the coordinates. And this is sort of a physical, phys uh, physics uh, inspired model. And you will have this QI as a latent variable. And then you try, you try to predict is actually the, the isolated uh, dipole moment. So if you compare these two fashions using the pinite, you will see that this physics inspired dipole model is actually more accurate compared to this atomic dipole. Which means if you're able to bring this physics into a machining model, you actually can improve the accuracy of the prediction. And then what about this latent variable is our charge. The charge was actually never used to fit in any quantity, right? It just sort of uh, come out as a as latent variable. And now what I'm showing you is that if I just plot the correlation between the, the predicted particle charge versus this is CM5 model. So this is a charge model five, uh, a kind of a charge model from the Chulas group. You can see that they actually have a very nice correlation, which is surprising because uh, we didn't actually fit any charge, right, to any reference charge. What we fit is actually the dipole moment. In other words, the machine learning model actually learned a bit of physics, right, in the process, and which is not just uh, actually give you a good number. So the example which I just showed is that we try to predict the dipole moments of isolated molecules, right? using the charge as latent variable. Because we know that atomic charge is not observable, right? You can have different uh, way to uh, analyze your charge. However, the dipole moment of isolated molecule is actually an experimental observable. So similarly, if you do the, the prediction for the condensed phase system, then what is actually can be measured in experiment is the supercell polarization. 
And what is not able to measure is actually the molecular dipole moments. So by, because of, we are encouraged by uh, what we show for the, for the isolated molecules, then we also actually apply the technique to look at how uh, the molecular dipole moment looks like for the condensed phase system. So why we're interested on the molecular dipole moments? Because this is actually a long lasting questions. So for example, in the liquid water, uh, people were quite interested about to know what is actually the molecular dipole moments. So one of the, uh, the milestone paper is, uh, came from the uh, Silvestelli and the Pellinello. So what they did in 1999 is actually, uh, they first actually run a CPMD calculation for the liquid water. And then after that, they used this so-called uh, maximized, localized, uh, maximized uh, localized vanier center to, to get actually the market dipole moments. So what is actually the maximum localized vanier center? So as you can see from this uh, uh, picture, this one year center, which draws this uh, orange ball, is represent the average position of uh, occupied orbitals. We know that for water, you have this uh, one year center, which in the between of the O and the uh, hydrogen and the oxygen atom, so that is a pair of electrons. And also you have the, uh, the other two one year center, which reflect the long pairs of the water molecule. And then the nice thing of lo uh, the maximum localized vanier center is that the sum of the molecular dipole moments from this uh, transformation actually gives you the correct supercell polarization. In other words, you can look into the distribution of individual water from the liquid water simulation and to see how the distribution looks like. And then what uh, Silvestelli and Paninello, what they found is that in the liquid water, the dipole moment of water molecule is about three the by, which is much larger, right? Compared to the gas phase uh, reference number, which is 1.86 the by. And the, the reason, of course, is due to the charge transfer and the, the mutual polar uh, polarizations between the water molecule in the condensed phase. And once you have this uh, value, then what you can do is you actually can plug into so-called Cook the formula and if you know so-called the, the, the uh, G factor, then you actually can predict the that constants of your liquids. So that's why, despite the fact that the market dipole moment is not really an absorbable, it's actually used for quantity, as similar as the atomic charge in many theoretical works. And then there is one thing which uh, is hidden, is that in a way to generate the vanier centers, you use a specific localization scheme, which is so-called the Boyd's localization, which try to minimize the spatial extent of your orbitals. But this is not a unique choice. You can also actually use so-called uh, Ad Admiston-Rudenberg localization, which try to maximize the self-repulsion energy. And then this actually motivates us to use the machine learning model to see what kind of localization the machine learning would give. And uh, the strategy we use is that we know that uh, what is actually observed in experiment in condensed phase is so called the barrier phase polarization, which is uh, generated from the, the transient current. Therefore, you can use the labels computed right, from your DFT calculation for the, uh, for the barrier phase polarization and then try to regress this quantity and then to see what kind of market dipole you would get from your machine learning model. And this is what, uh, what we did in this uh, work. And uh, so we use this, uh, 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 our pinite, right? This uh, graph convolutional neural network architecture, try to uh, predict the, the barrier phase polarization for the liquid water. And uh, so this is one thing. And second, we try to keep each water molecule charge neutral. You may see that this is, seems to a very natural uh, choice, but in fact, it's also bear one piece of uh, truth, is that uh, for the, for the barrier phase polarization, it can only change by an integer number times the polarization quantum. In other words, uh, the, each water molecule, in fact, should be charge neutral. So this is not just uh, come as a convenience, but in fact, this is actually a piece of physics. 
So by taking these two ingredients, uh, how actually our model looks like for the, uh, for the fitting. So here what I'm showing you is the, the prediction of the bare face polarization using the, our PyNet model versus the label. You can see that the fitting is almost perfect. And uh, so if you look at uh, what is showing on the table on the, on the right, uh, then we can see that the PyNet dipole is actually uh, perform much better compared to the baseline model, which is linear regression. And also by taking the charge neutrality, uh, the accuracy is improved. And now I'm showing what I'm going to show you is actually the most interesting part, which is to, now we actually can look how the market dipole moment inferred from the machine learning, because we didn't fit the market dipole moment right in the model. So this is really come from the regression to the manifolds, and then the machine learning model will decide actually what would be the best market dipole moments. And so you can see from this plot, which I show you the uh, market dipole moment inferred from PyNite versus the one-year dipole, which is a reference. And you can see this correlation is quite nice. And you don't just get the average value correct, but also the distribution almost, almost the same. And then the next question is, is this, is this good correlation, which, you, which we find is a coincidence? And in order to, uh, to answer this question, what we did is we also made another uh, model, which based on the vibrational principle. So in this model, uh, we actually applied two Lagrangian multipliers for both the barrier phase polarization and also for the charge neutrality. Since now these two physical constraints comes together with Lagrangian multipliers, which means they will be satisfied exactly. So now we have another model which actually satisfy these two conditions, right? By these two condition is uh, reproducing the bare phase polarization and keep the charge neutral. And then how actually the market dipole, if you do that, looks like. So this is uh, how the variational charge gives you regarding the market dipole moments in liquid water. You can see that they are very different from what the pine dipole would give. Despite that, both models actually satisfy these two physical constraints. This means uh, these two. This means actually the pinet dipole model is actually find the best uh, manifold to actually regress the the total uh, dipole moments, and then the what is come out as this symmetric dipole moments actually has a physical meaning. And then the, uh, then the next question you would ask is uh, how transferable, right, is our model? So to answer that, what we did is we take this data set from this paper published uh, in, in, in PNAS. And so they have actually water structures uh, which was generated at different water at different densities. So we take their structures and then do the calculation with both DFT and also our machine learning model. Then you can see that uh, without actually using this data in our training, the prediction was quite good. And it's not just good for the total polarization, but it's also quite well for the average dipole moment. You can see that this is uh, come out strictly. So, so far, what I have uh, talked about is actually how to use machine learning model for electrolytes where charge and solvent are important. Uh, but as uh, I motivate at the very beginning of the talk, what we actually interest is to model the electrochemical interface. And in particular, we were actually very actively working with this so-called finite field uh, DFTMD simulation to model the electrochemical interface. So this is a kind of method which was originated from the solid state uh, physics, uh, physics uh, community, where they look at the ground state ferroelectric electric system. So we took the method and tried to explore it for modeling electrochemical systems. So, so then, the, then the question is, uh, we can do this uh, uh, modeling with finite field, the DFTMD, but the, can we actually do it with the machine learning potential? And this is exactly what we are working on. So 
we are what we're working on is we try to actually find a scheme which able to handle the coupling of electric field to the machine learning potential. By doing that, we were able to actually to model the electrochemical interface. So with that said, I hope that I convinced you that the development of the atomic neural network is a promising and active uh, field where it has a potential to re revolutionize the materials modeling. And so far, all the descriptors we use is uh, local, which means uh, we need to actually take into account of long range and the charge transfer, as well as the coupling to the external field in order to model the electrochemical systems. So many of the things which I talk about today is actually uh, written in this uh, uh, mini review, which we published uh, this year on the battery and the supercapacitors. So before I close, uh, I want to insert uh, one piece of uh, advertisement. So together with my co-organizers, so we are organizing a second flagship workshop next year uh, in Italy. So, so if you're interested in, to know what about uh, the recent advances in machine learning accelerate market dynamics, then you are welcome to register. So we will do the workshop uh, in a hybrid format, which means even you cannot travel, you are still welcome to register. So with that said, I thank you very much for your listening. Thank you, Professor Shaozhang, for this nice talk. Uh, I, I can uh, wait here a little bit for questions to Shaozhang. Uh, let's see. When uh, people are interacting with us, I can uh, formulate a question to you because I had one uh, to start. OK. So right. OK. Are you? Are you hearing me okay? That's good? Yes, uh, yes I can hear you. Yes, let's, uh, good, let's good. do that. Yeah, so, Chalsang, uh, uh, I'd like to know a comment from you. Uh, if okay. you. If you have tested or simulated by machine learning the water anomalies, uh, you know? Uh, yes, you mean like the maximum density at... Uh, yeah, exactly. At, four, at 40 degree, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, example, did, yeah. Did you? Yes. Did, have you studied this uh, kind of uh, a problem for, from the water simulation? Yes. I mean, uh, we didn't, but uh, but this ha actually has been done with uh, by others. So this was actually one of the sort of first applications of machine learning potential. So this uh, this work from Yoko Beller's group, they look at actually these anomalies and. Uh, so what they did, what they did is that they tried to generate the data set at different densities and uh, then try to make a good uh, machine learning potential, which can predict the whole phase diagram of liquid water. And, yeah, nice. Uh, then they can, yeah, they actually can use different functionals, right? And also to see what's the impact of uh, DFT functional on the prediction of the the phase diagram of uh, water, and they actually can see there is be a uh, uh, density maximum around the yeah around the nice, four, four degrees okay good so uh let me see if here if we have another question from the youtube link please uh dear let participants uh, you can uh, interact with us i have here some comments uh Okay, I believe I can uh, uh, formulate another question to you because we have a little bit more time to do that. So, Chalsang, uh, uh, another uh, question I have is about the training process. Okay, uh, I right. uh, if I don't know if you remember, but uh, in the page uh, thirty-one, you mentioned yes. the uh, the training process. And uh, you mentioned that you use it, the QM9 the data set uh, yes, we for training. It, yes. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you can, you, how, yeah. how, is, how, how is the 
how how transferable is uh, mm. this training process? For example, uh, if you train your algorithm to this data set, okay, right. containing, I could see carbon, hydrogen, and also, I guess, oxygen atoms. Uh, yes. So basically, we have their organic compounds. Yeah. Yes. And then, uh, and then we we can uh, we need to try or we we want to to test and apply this algorithm to uh, a kind yeah. of uh, other uh, complex organic compounds, uh, mm -hmm. but maybe containing uh, a sulfur atom, okay? Okay. Or a nitrogen right. atom, not exactly right. just right. only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Yes. 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 We will need to train uh, the data set against another data set containing sulfur, or yes. the algorithm can capture uh, the properties, even yes. attending so, uh, a, a small atom in the molecule. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Well, I understand. And the, the, the answer is actually uh, several, several folds. So, uh, so for different machine learning models, uh what is important is always what is your data set and then what is your descriptors right so which yeah. means uh, if you have a super good descriptors you might not rely on very much on the completeness of your data set which means uh, even you don't for example have a sulfur but you only have a carbon nitrogen like oxygen you might actually do a little bit extrapolations to sulfur if you have a good descriptor. But if, suppose that your descriptor is not su superb, then what do you do? Then you need to actually enlarge your data set, right? Which means you try to cover the, the configurations which are the molecules which contain the software. Which means you, you actually show your machine learning model with more data. And then it, of course, will learn it. Yeah. So this is the two aspects. It's a sort of like a, yeah, the two sides of the same coin. And then there are actually a third uh, aspect of this is that if you do with, with neural network, like deep learnings, and then you also face the issue that your final performance actually depends on your training algorithm. And we just have a recent paper which published and uh, which actually show that if you take established data sets and then you use different training algorithms, then your final uh, potential would actually have different performance in real applications. So they all look the same when you actually do the validations, but they, do, they, they will behave differently when you actually apply them in real cases. So this okay, is actually a three, three aspect, yeah, I think one should be, should be care about, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I have uh, a last one here, a comment uh, from Jerry Bubalan. Uh, Please suggest some elementary text to, to learn machine learning for chemistry graduates. Can you give us uh, yes. suggestions for test, textbook, so, I guess? Uh, yes. So, uh, I, so right now, I don't think there will be a actually textbook written for, let's say, machine learning chemistry. I think this is actually a very good suggestion. So we might actually think about, uh, like my colleagues, and uh, to actually good. write maybe such a book. Nice, yeah. nice. And uh, yes, but uh, nevertheless, as I said, there are actually a number of good review papers, which is because this is a very active field. So there are actually good review and uh, perspective papers. And uh, so actually, I can probably leave some uh, good uh, like that in the in the chat, which uh, you actually can check out later. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Uh, maybe I can complement your answer, sharing the book written by Professor Vijay Pant. Uh, if you, Jerry Frederick, uh, could notice Professor Chao Zhang uh, shared in your presentation, in his presentation, uh, a work published by Professor Vijay Pand. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the book written by Vijay Pand is, nice, uh, is a nice book to introduce you in machine learning uh, methods, okay? So thank you, Chao Zhang, again. Um, very thanks uh, for uh, your talk here uh, on the workshop. Thank you. Yes, yes.
thank you very much, Luciano. And uh, and yes, it was actually uh, yeah. So we can, um, uh, I can share here my screen and so go I to stop the sharing next. And uh, unmute myself. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. So uh, we're gonna have now uh, an, a talk about materials by design toward a sustainable world, coupling mode scale simulations, virtual reality, and machine learning, given by Professor Caetano Miranda. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Professor Caetano Miranda to accept our invitation. And uh, Professor Caetano Miranda is from the Department of Material Physics and Mechanics at the University of Sao Paulo. He was also assistant professor at Kyoto University between 2007 2009. And uh, also, he's working on mode scale simulations, virtual reality, and machine learning talks. He has more than 2,000 citations, the index, the age index of 23, and the published papers of uh, 68. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us, Professor Caetano Miranda. Please, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Luciano. Let me try to share my screen here and see if it does work. Yes. Is everything okay? Okay. Thank well, you. Thanks so, thanks so much for the, your kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I hope that is everyone well. And uh, I'd like to thank also the organizers for this incredible opportunity to uh, attend and also contribute to the workshop on the computational chemistry and share some of our, the work that we're doing in the, the, uh, in the Physics Institute of the University of Sao Paulo. So this, is, this work is a timely combination of uh, uh, materials engineer, a chemistry, a mechanical engineer, and also a physicist in the sense of uh, towards the materials design by design towards a, a sustainable world. So I would like to share with you is a proof of concept on the materials discovery uh, towards this uh, sustainable world. And uh, uh, for doing that, uh, let me first introduce the, our group in the uh, Institute of Physics in the University of Sao Paulo. So you are mainly interested on the uh, try to connect the atomic, uh, atomic, atomic scale properties of materials towards the problems that is somehow related with the industry industrial challenges in Brazil. And we're going to do that uh, using the combination of uh, multi-scale molecular simulations. And as I mentioned in the title, you'll try to uh, also include it, uh, something that is very close to what uh, uh, Professor Zhang had just mentioned uh, regarding to the uh, machine learning methods and also the virtual reality in order to be able uh, uh, to make the design of materials using the combination of both. So, and then you're going first, uh, uh, I, I choose two examples for you to share with you. The first one is related uh, to the advanced alloys, I mean, the design of alloys for biomedical and aerospace applications because you, you are under extreme conditions at the same time you need to uh, take care about several of the problems that uh, you may have it uh, uh, to use those materials. The second one is related to the CO2 capture, sequestration and use. And uh, uh, again, you're going to try to use these tools uh, in order to really change the, uh, our uh, framework in terms of uh, how can you design materials from the computation point of view. And uh, this will be done with a combination of uh, several uh, tools that I'm going to uh, share and explain to you. Now, uh, one thing that uh, uh, is also important uh, related to is the, uh, the title of my, uh, my talk 
is uh, regarding to how sustainable and clean are those. Because you are very much interested on the work on materials that is uh, relevant for energy and environment applications from a multi-scale perspective. So for several years, actually, my group, you are mainly interested to use this multi-scale approach uh, for the oil and gas industry. However, I believe that with the, uh, the needs now, you really have to go for this uh, energy transition towards a renewable energy. And some of the examples that I'm going to show to you is related to uh, uh, how clean and uh, how, how can you use uh, the material design in order to make it uh, cleaner uh, at the same time to be able uh, to approach some problems that is related with sustainability. So uh, in the way that I'm going to do that is uh, every time that I'm going to show an example of the project, uh, I may try to address how this project can be helpful for the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And uh, in this way, uh, you are going to try to, to do this combination of uh, a designer uh, from the materials point of view. However, uh, I was trying to uh, look for uh, uh, how these applications can be useful in, towards a sustainable world. So this is more or less uh, uh, the agenda here. And I'm going to, uh, to show you with you some of the examples that you're doing the uh, Institute of Physics, the University of Sao Paulo. Now, how you do that? Uh, no? And for doing that, uh, uh, I know that uh, I, many of the people here is from the chemistry community. Uh, however, this, this idea that I'm going to show to you is something that is uh, go beyond uh, the title that I'm calling Physics X in the sense of uh, to be able uh, to change uh, uh, our, uh, the way that you, you play with the design of materials, but not only with the eyes of uh, a physicist or chemistry, but also from the eyes of the designer. So in this way, many of the experiences uh, you're going to happen at uh, immersive experience, experiences, at the same time, uh, to be able to play with the material as a designer play with some object or play some uh, with ideas. So this is more or less uh, uh, what we're going to try to combine here. This is why you have to use this multi-scale approach at the same time uh, to use uh, uh, virtual reality and uh, the machine learning. So I'm going to explain how this uh, three uh, tools can be combined in order to uh, help us uh, on the material design. So one of the point, uh, key points here is that uh, despite of the, uh, the demand for uh, high performance materials, um, so the traditional way that you try to uh, make the material discovery is usually empirical uh, methodology. It means it's mainly based on try and error. So uh, usually the material design uh, also involved a very intricate and multidimensional uh, optimization problem. So this means that it requires uh, links between the parameters and also some specific properties of the interesting that usually are unknown. So uh, the idea here is to try to look for uh, a trial in terms of uh, which materials you should produce or you should look for. And uh, uh, for doing that, you, the strategies is only the best candidates should be uh, have to be synthesized, characterized, and tested. So in this way here, you're going to use the, uh, the computational material design in order to choose the ones that is the best. Uh, and you're going to do that uh, using a combination of several uh, tools. And uh, uh, mainly, you'll be interested to use either the so-called first principle calculations or molecular modeling uh, together with something that the Professor Zhang has uh, explored in the previous talk that is related with uh, uh, artificial intelligence, in particular, uh, the machine learning uh, methods that you can apply together with the uh, computational material design. So the idea is to really be able to combine those techniques in order to make a better selection of materials and then uh, to look for uh, the applications that uh, uh, you are mainly uh, interested to. Now, so how how this can be going beyond what is already uh, uh, 
be done uh, on our community. And for doing that, uh, I may try to uh, can give you an inspiration uh, where uh, uh, you produce uh, uh, in our lab in the Institute of Physics in the University of Sao Paulo. That is this idea that you can play with the chemical elements uh, very uh, in, from the uh, design feature. So uh, in this way that uh, you can choose what elements you are interested in and you already have an idea about which properties uh, uh, you're going to take it. So uh, this sounds uh, very uh, much uh, science fiction. So this was uh, from a science fiction movie, actually. However, you already have, you are already in, in the conditions to do something very similar what you just have solved. Uh, the idea here is to try to make this combination of tools that allow us to be able to explore uh, uh, the materials from this very uh, perspective idea uh, uh, from the designer. And uh, uh, the key point here is try to try to have this experience where you're going to, uh, to be at the same size of atoms and molecules. So uh, you are we are trying to improve our immersive experience at a nanoscale. And uh, the inspiration here is to try to be shrink uh, as uh, the Alice uh, in the Waterland. So, and they explore others' uh, senses, not only the visual one or not only the, uh, the acknowledgement that you know about uh, uh, quantum mechanics or uh, uh, from the materials point of view, but also to be able uh, to have this experience of the physical systems uh, at the same scale as our physical perception. So it means that uh, you're going to interact with, with our system and this can be done using, for instance, uh, virtual reality. In the, uh, nowadays, you are in the, uh, already in the place where in the past you used it to visualize, for instance, uh, some molecular dynamics or some uh, uh, atomistical simulations. Now you are already uh, able to be within the, uh, the system that you are interested in. And uh, uh, together with a machine learning process, and also uh, the multi-scale approach, you are able now to interact with the system. So uh, the idea here is to really to have a, an intuition about uh, uh, the system that you are interested in, and also uh, to be able to choose or change or modify your system uh, during uh, on the fly. I mean, during your uh, experience, immersive experience, and learn about this experience. So it means that uh, uh, you're really going for uh, towards a uh, designer view of the material design than really uh, from the physics or the chemistry point of view. So I'm going to show to you some of the examples that we're doing mm -hmm. and also make a, a invitation about uh, uh, to visit us uh, in Sao Paulo, probably uh, when it will be possible to have such experience on the uh, material design. Now, how this can be possible. So this will be possible with the combination of several tools. The first one, uh, the so-called the computational material science in the sense of uh, to use, for instance, first principle calculations or uh, molecular modeling from a very uh, broad perspective. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you, are, you have to be able to interact with our system in such a way that you're going to look for the material design using virtual reality. To do for those uh, to be able to do such a uh, thing, uh, you are you're going to use the combination of uh, other two uh, methodologies. The first one has been already shown uh, in the previous talk by Professor Zhang. So uh, the idea is to use the data analytics, mainly machine learning methods, in order to be able to capture either the turnkey structure or uh, also the uh, atomic uh, atomic interactions between atoms and molecules, and uh, in this way, accelerate the process of uh, uh, to see and to visualize uh, those interactions. But uh, uh, you also would like to include it, the so-called perceptive uh, physics. This means that uh, you're going to use not only the vision uh, as a tool to play with uh, our, uh, the atoms and molecules on the uh, virtual environment, but also try to approach using, uh, for instance, uh, uh, 
by lesson, by, by the smell, uh, uh, by the, the shapes of the sense, and also the pressure. Uh, so in this way, to have a more complete uh, uh, sensing about uh, uh, this immersive experience. So this is what we are calling physics X, in the sense that you have the combination of both uh, data analytics together with this more broader uh, uh, sensing uh, using uh, uh, not only the vision, but also uh, other senses that you have it uh, uh, in your body. Now, uh, again, I think the, point, the key point here is to be able uh, to have expenses in scales that are far beyond our daily life. At the same time, uh, you would like to understand the waters, the fundamental mechanisms behind uh, the phenomena and some of the technologies, and to be able to optimize and design materials according to the composition, the morphology, and also the process, and mainly uh, to be able also to guide uh, experiments in order to give uh, some support for the experimental initiatives. So this is more or less the idea when you're talking about uh, uh, this material designer from uh, the fix, physics X uh, perspective. Now, uh, to do that, uh, uh, you're going to, to do this combination of uh, multi-scale molecular simulations, machine learning, and virtual reality. So Professor Zhang also have shown something similar to that uh, in his talk. And uh, I just want to emphasize the needs to have uh, this multi-scale approach in such a way that uh, you can really go from atoms and molecules up to applications. And I'm going to give to you an example of that. Uh, at the same time, uh, you'd like to have this as a combination of uh, uh, several tools. In the, the way that machine learning is going to enter uh, on this uh, the design approach is also similar to what uh, Professor Zhang have shown before, where you're going to try to use the machine learning uh, in, in the order of, uh, first of all, to make this high throughput uh, uh, survey about the materials and possibilities. In the second point, uh, it should be able to have a, a much more uh, faster way to calculate uh, uh, the, uh, the atomic interactions based, for instance, on the disk functional theory or first principle calculations. So uh, in this manner, uh, you really can combine now with the virtual reality and uh, accelerate the process of uh, during the uh, the way that uh, during the experience where I can take uh, an atom and change uh, uh, what is the element, for instance, and see what happens from the electronic structure point of view or see what happens from the dynamics point of view. This brings to us uh, uh, the intuition about what is going on. And uh, uh, you can really plug and play and try to check uh, uh, and think about as a designer, you know, more than really uh, a material scientist, where you're going to look for the only for the fundamentals. You can really think about in a broader way uh, how to uh, how to do with that? So then we're going to do this combination of both uh, the scale molecular simulations, the machine learning in order to accelerate the process of uh, calculating the uh, interactions, as well uh, to make the survey of uh, the materials and the virtual reality in order to uh, play as a designer. Now, let me change for the first example of such experience. And this, it has to do uh, with the problem of uh, uh, to be able you know, to, uh, for looking for materials, in particular for biomedical applications. And here I'm going to make the combination between machine learning and also the multi-scale approach where you can go from first principle calculations up to the finite elements. So we really can go uh, the full circle uh, here uh, in the terms of uh, uh, the design of the materials. Now, so this example will be a really a journey uh, of the combination of several uh, multi-scale and the multi-physics methodologies in order to discover, discover new materials. Would you like to check the stability of these materials at the same time to characterize and test them on real operational conditions? So, fully from the computation point of view. 
Now, uh, first, uh, you're going to see that uh, uh, you're going to use the machine learning in order to predict some of the elastic properties based only on the composition. Then you're going to validate uh, this uh, uh, the thermodynamic properties of those materials that does not exist yet in nature and select some of the materials based on the first principle calculations. And finally, see for uh, practical applications using the finite elements. Now, uh, the interesting for, uh, you are interested to, uh, to study this structure in biomaterials in bio plants. So this is a very challenging problem because you have to combine the metallic implants with bonds, which usually is a very uh, complex pore structure. Uh, at the same time, you have a conditions that are uh, on the, your external part of the bone. Usually, you have a high elastic modula, modulus, and in the soft part, the interior of the bones, you have a, a low modulus that is a live. The, usually, it's the live part. You have fluids uh, uh, also transport on, the, on that. So, the right combination of the density and the elastic properties is essential in order to prevent some bone stress, a shield effect that you, you mainly have on the system. And uh, uh, this kind of application, it has a huge market, particularly when you're talking about the keen and the hip joint plants. Just to give you an idea, in Brazil, a very uh, uh, some years ago, you're talking about something that is the order of 5.5 billion US dollars per year uh, that uh, uh, you expand with you import such implants, even if you have the raw natural resources. So this is something that uh, you have to think about how to uh, to really use it in a, a smart way. Uh, uh, this material. So our problem then is to look for materials uh, or alloys that can be used for bio uh, materials or bio implants in such a way that you can uh, have a, a, a parallel or can have a substitution for the reference material that nowadays is still very expensive. Now, uh, what you know about it? Uh, so what are our competitors? And also, what is the design limitation that you have it, that you have to look for uh, when you're doing this uh, material design? So, so far, the low modulus uh, titanium alloys uh, has been used, you know, and the, our best, it has already more than 20 years, so it's so-called the gun metal. It has been developed uh, uh, in such a way that uh, uh, you have a high strength, at the same time, low elastic moduli, and a good biocompatibility. Uh, bio, uh, However, the price is, is still quite high. Uh, so what you are looking for is some good op uh, good options or good materials uh, that can be a good candidate in order to substitute uh, such uh, system. And uh, in order to do that, you have to first of all to search for the potential good candidates by exploring what is so called the periodic uh, table for the structural biomaterials in the plants. So here you have some of the metallic uh, elements in your periodic table, and you can see uh, uh, how this, how will be the biocompatibility of uh, those elements. Uh, but here I have to stress that you're talking about only for the pure elements. Uh, in the combination of uh, uh, the low cost and biocompatibility, uh, can lead us for the choice, uh, for the best choice for a given alloy. So if you look for this uh, on this periodic table, basically uh, you can select some of the elements like titanium, zirconium, and niobium. And uh, what we're going to look for is based on this composition, titanium, niobium, and zirconium, uh, what would be the best combination, the best ternary system that allow us to look for materials that have a low uh, elastic moduli, at the same time, to be stable you know, for a given uh, uh, phase or structure, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully at a low cost. So this is our challenge. So you have to really look for 
on the uh, universe, universe of possibilities that you may have it on this composition would be the best composition that uh, uh, can help us on this, uh, uh, on this matter. Now, uh, how are you going to do that? So uh, the idea is to really make this uh, combination of several methodologies where you're going to use machine learning in order to provide a model based only on the composition in order to be able uh, uh, to map the elastic properties of those materials. Then once that you have this mapping, you're going to look for what will be the best options in terms of the composition. For instance, here I have the phase diagram uh, for the uh, respect to the elastic model modulus of uh, uh, the standard system. So it means that for each point here on this uh, on this standard diagram, uh, experimentally you have to synthesize, characterize, and test it. So uh, the idea is to using this machine learning model, you'll be able to uh, search for the best options. Then on this, uh, uh, once that you identify the best options, uh, the idea is really to see if this material is going to be stable at uh, uh, room temperature or in the operational conditions. And finally, check it out uh, if you uh, alloy with this material, you're going to be helpful for real applications. So you're really going from the uh, mining with the discover, the characterization stability, at the same time to validate and test uh, the applications under uh, uh, operational conditions. So how you do that? For, uh, uh, because the, uh, the, the amount of possibility here is, is, uh, does not allow us to do fully uh, by first principles. So then you have to do a, a strategy in order to be able to capture uh, uh, those systems. So uh, here I'm going to uh, just give it to you an overview about what have we used so far. So uh, in the particular case for the databases, you have used the materials project uh, database. On the machine learning uh, techniques, you have used several of these uh, libraries, in particular uh, the CAR Keras and the TensorFlow in order to make our models. Uh, for the density functional calculations, you have used the, uh, the, uh, the software VASP under uh, some of uh, uh, the functionals that uh, uh, you have available, in particular here, the GGA with PBE. And finally, the finite element simulations, you have used uh, a set of uh, softwares that allow us to build it up uh, the mesh at the same time to look for the multi physics of those problems. Now here, particularly using the Elmer uh, software to do that. Now, uh, our problem started to, from the, uh, our strategy is mainly uh, to be able to look for uh, a model where you can make the prediction of the elastic properties. However, I have to reinforce this information that is based, based only on composition at the first step. Then you're going to add information about the structure. Now, uh, to do that, uh, you first of all, you uh, have a look for the, uh, the databases. Here in particular, you have used the materials project one, where you're looking for the composition and the structure of uh, uh, several structures possible over uh, the possibilities that you have it now. And uh, uh, to do that uh, in general, uh, you end up with more than uh, 14,000 uh, possibilities. If you only consider the transition in both transition methods, so you have to filter in, uh, filter in uh, uh, these possibilities. So if you exclude the compounds with ionic or covalent character, you decrease to almost uh, 5,000 possibilities. Then you keep going by uh, looking for uh, materials that have elastic properties that is in the range of the titanium alloys. This goes to half of the previous one, so uh, almost 2,000. 500 uh, possibilities. And finally, uh, all the, uh, the materials that you have information about the heat formation and uh, uh, the entropy of mixing. So uh, in the end, you have something of uh, around 20,000 
possibility that you have still looking for. Now, uh, to do that, uh, uh, you have to look for the composition of features, and you apply uh, feature selection here, where basically uh, on this uh, exploratory step on the machine learning process, mm -hmm. you're looking for the features that is potentially uh, the best in order to describe a specific target property here. And uh, uh, for our problem, it's mainly the elastic uh, data, no, the elasticity data, in order to be able uh, to end up with a model, you know, uh, to feed the, the linear models, like a uh, uh, run of forest or, or artificial uh, neural, neural networks, uh, where you're going to train in some of the predict uh, predictive models for either the book modulus or the shear modulus based only on the composition. So this was more or less what you have done. Uh, in the uh, for the machine learning uh, process, you, know, you could observe the shear modulus uh, is linear, both on the, uh, from the linear models or uh, on the run of flores. If you compare here the training and also the uh, test set. So uh, you also implemented this for the neural networks. And the one thing that is important uh, here is that uh, uh, you have imp implemented that using the Keras. Uh, this is a, a filter, uh, is a technique that allows us to, uh, to rank uh, what is the features based on the, uh, uh, on the properties that you are interested in. It do, we have been able to identify at least 20 features that uh, uh, for each target that uh, uh, give us our best uh, round of flower, florist uh, regresso uh, that I show here, for instance. You know? And uh, uh, with that, you end up with a model uh, where you can predict the shear modulus and also the, uh, the Poisson ratio, for instance, uh, as our dominant description descriptor uh, uh, to describe uh, our alloy, the elastic properties of uh, our alloy system. So in the end, uh, uh, on the machine learning port, uh, process, you have been able to obtain a model where very quickly you can survey over the, our possibilities in terms of the composition for these uh, three elements. Here, using a model by uh, Rana Flores, he is using a model by uh, neural networks, where uh, in the end, uh, you end up uh, uh, by describing how the composition of phase diagram is changing for the titanium niobe system. Now, uh, you could see that uh, you, uh, you have been able to identify a, a sweet spot region on the large model I, that is more or less uh, this composition here. And uh, uh, with that, uh, uh, you have to remember that uh, many of our machine learning models here still agnostic to structure. So the only information that uh, I'm included is the composition. Now, uh, based the, in order to validate this, uh, this information and also to check it out the possibility of uh, uh, visualize if this uh, composition's okay or not. So what you have done is uh, to include it also information about uh, uh, the structure. So to do that, uh, you have used it uh, uh, first principle calculation based on the uh, this function theory in order to uh, evaluate the stability of uh, uh, the alloy phases here, particularly you are interested on this uh, kind of a structure, the so-called beta structure, that you uh, have the low, uh, low moduli, uh, modulus of uh, uh, the system. But now, but uh, you know from the phase diagram of titanium, for instance, with pressure and temperature, you know that uh, the alpha phase is the one that is stable at uh, a lower temperature. So you have to be able to check it out uh, uh, how can you keep it uh, the low uh, modulize of this structure. And to do that, uh, you really have to look for the uh, stability, particularly to look for what is going on when you go uh, for temperatures like the so-called uh, beta transits, that you have the transition between uh, those structures. 
So in order to stabilize the material, uh, you mainly uh, you have the you need to alloy with some uh, uh, systems like niobium, tantalum, and uh, other ones. At the same time, you have to avoid that this beta phase transform to the omega. So it's not only the machine learning does not give you all, but it's, it does give it to, to us uh, a sense of uh, decomposition. Now you have to use the uh, first principle calculations in order to be able to monitor you know, uh, the stability of uh, uh, for a given composition, how is the stability of the structure with respect to the temperature and pressure. So this was more or less what you have done and you estimated the total energy before and after uh, uh, the relaxations of those systems. At the same time, check it out uh, to, to monitor you know, uh, if you have a, uh, a change in the structure uh, and calculate the free energies with respect to the temperature and the pressure. Now, based on that, uh, uh, you are then able to select some candidates. So uh, this is the best compositions with uh, the uh, electric properties. And the, what you learn is that uh, if you have it, some, uh, I didn't show to you, but uh, if you have some uh, amount of uh, niobium that is uh, around 11%, this improves the properties for the elastic properties point of view. And you, vis uh, you identify some special focus, uh, some special uh, compositions that I showed to you here. So those compositions has not been synthesized yet. However, by first principle calculations, uh, you have been able to fully characterize from the thermodynamic point of view and also from the structural point of view. Uh, at the same time, uh, those composition, it come out based on our machine learning uh, model. You know? And uh, uh, if you know the composition using first principle calculations, you have been able to determine all the elastic properties of those systems. And uh, the idea here is, of, of course, uh, uh, you have to compare with uh, what, what our machine learning model gives us uh, in comparison with uh, the first principle calculations. However, uh, uh, in this particular case, you can see some differences in some of the compositions. However, you fully capture what uh, uh, you expect, uh, what you're expecting. Uh, at the same time, uh, the exercise here is to make a survey about uh, uh, all these possibilities. Now, uh, by doing that, uh, what you end up uh, is that uh, uh, with those uh, uh, compositions, you really have a potential alternative for the standard material that is used uh, uh, in the in the industry. You know? So this makes this uh, uh, these compositions a very attractive candidates. Uh, and also, uh, if you take account only the raw material, uh, it's maybe a low cost composition, and you have a close. Uh, uh, combination with uh, the binary titanium zirconia uh, uh, system that uh, you have it uh, uh, on the as a reference. So our problem now is to see if we, this composition that you have discovered from the combination of machine learning together with first principle calculations can really be useful for real applications. So to do that, uh, then uh, uh, you end up with two models. The first model is a, a tone fix plate uh, where you're going to, uh, to make the junction uh, with the bond and you're going to apply a given uh, uh, axial and also compressive load over the system and check it out how will be the effort, uh, 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 the stress uh, on the system comparing the different materials that you have. Remember that so far, this composition has not been synthesized yet. Uh, the second model is a heat joint plant model where uh, you're also going to simulate this uh, compressive, uh, axial compressive load and to check it out uh, uh, if this, this could be also a good material for such implants. Joshua, uh, here I summarize what you know about the bone 
So uh, here, uh, now I want to use the finite elements in order to validate uh, uh, the applicability of this, uh, this material discover and also summarize the properties of the alloys. The first one is the reference one that is available commercially nowadays. And the other two are those that uh, you figure out uh, from this exercise where you combine machine learning together with first principle calculations. Now, uh, let us see what uh, uh, you could learn from that. So here's the stress distribution for those implant models. So you can see you're looking for this region in you know, the uh, human body. And you're going to compare what you know from the reference material together uh, in, the, in terms of the stress together with these two compositions that you have already uh, figured out. Now, what we can learn is that from the uh, either qualitative and also quantitative point of view, you, know, you have a, a, a response that is, uh, the mechanical response is similar to the one of the reference. Uh, you learn that mainly uh, the stress is located uh, around uh, this creole uh, hole that is close to the T-junction here. Uh, at the same time, you also look for the, uh, the other uh, uh, model that is trying to uh, uh, substitute this part in the human body. In the, the, the mechanical response, here you're going to see the uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, stress. Uh, it's around uh, 600, uh, 500 uh, megapascal. That is something that is show to us that uh, these compositions that, uh, again, has not been, uh, does not exist yet, only in our exercise, it be, is able to capture uh, uh, the same mechanical response as the reference uh, uh, material. So this is a very interesting part in terms of, uh, uh, so the machine learning method, it allows us to capture the features and also to define the composition switch parts for the ternary uh, alloys. Remember, from the experimental point of view, for each point in the, uh, on the ternary diagram, I have to synthesize, test it, and also characterize those materials. Here, you could do it uh, in a fraction of a second. Now, uh, but uh, it's only composition. So uh, what you learn from the machine learning, model, uh, machine learning method, you could use the uh, first principle calculations in order to explore the compositional rates. Uh, you could learn uh, based on the, uh, on the uh, first principle calculations, the importance of Niobium on the structure, then uh, at the same time on the elastic properties. And finally, you have to use it, the finite elements in order to explore a real case system. So uh, where you could compare the materials that you have figured out based on this coupling between machine learning and first principle calculations with the standard material that is already used in the industry. And uh, you could, uh, no significant in, uh, difference has been observed so far. So you could con conclude that uh, this uh, multi-scale approach uh, where you can combine machine learning together with uh, uh, multi-scale uh, molecular simulations in order to be able to predict and also to uh, have a comparable material with the standard one that is used uh, uh, on the industry. So this is somehow uh, the first case that I choose to you. Let me uh, very quickly move to a second topic uh, that it has to do with the capture sequestration and use of CO2, just to give to you an idea that uh, how broad uh, could be the strategy to, uh, for material design. So here you're talking with several of uh, uh, the sustainable goals uh, uh, of the United Nations. So what is the problem uh, here? No, mainly you're interested in to capture and sequestrate, uh, and you have the sequestration of CO2. And in order to do that, uh, you have to, uh, to see this problem for a, a long term. So, uh, so what would be the possibilities where you can uh, have the capture of CO2 or even the transformation of CO2, uh, for instance, in a mineral or dissolve the CO2 in also some ge geochemical process? 
And uh, to do that, uh, we have to choose uh, a good material that is able for uh, capture in a large scale, it means tons of CO2 uh, uh, for a given amount uh, of those material. Now, uh, what do you need it then? Uh, what is the features from the material design point of view that you need it for uh, CO2 capture? So first of all, uh, you need a material that uh, uh, it needs to have a large surface area. At the same time, a good absorption capability. You no, know? it should capture the CO2 uh, selectivity, and also it does not require uh, significant energy during this uh, capture process. And finally, it will be good if it's inexpensive and also at the same time environmentally friendly. So there are class of uh, very few classes of material can attend fully uh, all these requirements. One of them is the so-called clays. And uh, uh, here we'll be interested in this particular clay, uh, the nickel, nickel flu fluorite, fluorectorite, uh, where uh, experimentally has been observed that this material have a very large, uh, can, is able to capture you know, CO2 on a large scale. But then you need to understand uh, what is going on behind, uh, beyond uh, what is the mechanism behind behind uh, uh, the capture, or even to be used as, uh, as a catalyst uh, uh, system? Now, uh, what you can learn from the uh, so a key point here is the choice of the uh, ionic, uh, the metallic ion that you can include it uh, or between the uh, uh, the surfaces of the uh, the clay. You know? And uh, what is known is that uh, if you have a, a small uh, ionic radii, you are not able usually to capture CO2. And if you have a large amount, uh, larger radii, this will be uh, more possible. So again, if we're looking for the ionic radii uh, in the periodic table, uh, you could see that uh, for those systems, it has already given to us an idea about what is going on. However, uh, experimentally, they saw that uh, for the case of uh, nickel, uh, that you have a, a smaller radii, uh, ionic radii, even smaller than uh, the sodium case, uh, you are able to capture a large amount of CO2. So uh, then experimentally, basically what they, uh, they looked for was the amount of CO2. So this is important, the density of CO2 for a given condition. Here's uh, for this, uh, uh, this under this pressure in the under the, this temperature. So is able to capture uh, uh, around uh, one ton of CO2 per uh, cubic meter. Now, uh, this is possible because now you can make engineering in terms of this distance you know, uh, between the uh, clay plates. In the experimentally, what they do is uh, they basically uh, you have the water, so you can see this uh, swelling effect of the, the clay. Then under the heating process, the water is uh, going out. So then you inject the CO2 you know, as a, uh, in a supercritical regime or, or in the liquid uh, phase uh, on the clay, and you could see the effect of the swelling. So it means that uh, uh, the CO2 is captured there, and you can monitor this by uh, measuring uh, here using uh, uh, X-ray uh, diffraction and also neutral diffraction, uh, the distance between in on this plane. So basically uh, here you have an indication that uh, you are, uh, on this direction, you are injecting CO2 and you see an increasing of this G space uh, uh, on the clay. Now, why? The case of the nickel works, uh, and you have a, such a, a very good response on that. So to do that, uh, then uh, you have applied first principle calculations where you monitor the interaction of CO2 and water uh, uh, with respect to the different planes of uh, uh, this clay. Here uh, you have a summary of the, uh, the absorption energies, either under confinement at the same time with the surface, and also, you monitor the G spacing. So, uh, and you could see 
what is going on, uh, on for the, a particular system. Now, uh, what you have done is, uh, uh, on this uh, particular case, uh, we could uh, observe that uh, uh, from the experimental point of view, and also based on the uh, ab initio molecular dynamics, you could see that you have a transition you know, on those on the systems where uh, in the interaction with the water, and also uh, uh, you have a deformation of uh, another phase, the uh, nickel hydroxide, uh, where you have a, a region that actually is not, uh, the CO2 is not able to be captured when you have only the nickel uh, ions, as you already knew from uh, uh, our previous uh, uh, results. However, if you have this, uh, uh, this new phase, uh, you are able then to capture the CO2. Now, uh, with this formation of uh, uh, the beta nickel hydroxide. Well, uh, the question is, uh, can you do better? No, can you really understand what is going on? And also at the same time, to be able uh, to monitor uh, uh, if you are validated those ideas. So uh, then you can compare the experimental with the modern part. So and basically you are able to capture uh, the same dist the dist the distance that has been seen from uh, uh, the experimental point of view. No? And uh, something that you could do uh, also from the uh, modeling point of view, I'm going to just accelerate, sorry for, because of the time, that is, you are able then to check it out. Uh, if I change the surface charge of my clay, you know, how will be the effect in terms of the energy? So it means that uh, you could improve even further uh, the adsorption of a CO2 when you are playing with that, experimentally, this can be very different, very difficult and complex to, uh, to make this engineering. However, uh, based on the uh, molecular modeling, this coupling with first principle correlation, and uh, uh, I'm going to show soon about the, uh, the experience with uh, the virtual reality, you are able to uh, provide information that could be very helpful for the experimental point of view. Now, as a summary, so the second part of this work was a combination where, uh, in collaboration with experimental people on the Norway University of Science Technology, uh, Professor uh, Yonoto Fossum, where you could uh, understand what is going on from the experimental point of view and provide information from the materials designer, for materials design for those uh, uh, systems, for those for the to guide the experimental in order to uh, improve uh, uh, the material design. So let me just to finalize with another point that for me is uh, very important and also has to do with our community, for the physics, chemistry, and also for the material science point of view. That is the social role of science. And uh, 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 here you're going to use those ideas of uh, a virtual reality and also the combination of sound uh, uh, in order to uh, also understand the, uh, the behavior properties of materials in order to show to the uh, public, the external public, about uh, the experience, what is nanotechnology, what is to uh, really live on this uh, nanotechnology uh, scale. And this can be done using the combination of virtual reality and sonification. Uh, in this, this project called Maria's, is uh, in order to uh, provide for low-income students, and particularly for human girls in science technology, uh, some uh, immersive experiences uh, where by using a low cost, so those uh, devices is done using uh, re uh, re recycled materials, uh, paper, uh, cardboard, and uh, uh, some uh, plastic bottles, where uh, you can really go for uh, understanding of the non-scale using uh, some techniques. So you're bringing the frontier of our, our research for the general public, particularly those that uh, uh, does not have so much uh, income or have some uh, issues from the economical point of view. Now, uh, let me also, this can be done. Uh, it has been done for general uh, public events. 
And uh, this idea to be able to play with your system, this is something that uh, has really changed the, uh, the way that you can uh, design materials. This is somehow the key message that I, I would like to share with you. And uh, I just want to make an invitation uh, so as soon as possible that uh, you can uh, visit us in Sao Paulo. You, during this period, you have been able to uh, set a lab where you can play with the virtual reality and on the design of materials. And particularly, this is for the general public at the same time, is use it for, uh, for research on material design for several applications. And uh, you are looking, you also have built it, the so-called uh, molecularium. I mean, uh, at the same time that you have the planetarium that you can express uh, the, uh, uh, what is going on from the astronomy point of view, uh, you have built it up a data set with several information that you can either visualize the molecule at the same time to listen to the uh, vibrational modes of the molecule using sonification. Uh, at the same time, the public can contribute with more uh, uh, information and add more information our, with our data set. And this is done with the combination of virtual reality, machine learning, and also the multi-scale approach. So uh, I think with that, as a summary, uh, I provide uh, uh, this idea about a physics X, where this, this is the integrated multi-scale method where you can couple uh, data analytics and also perceptual physics. Uh, so I choose two, two problems to show to you. One is uh, the material discovery for biomedical applications. And the second one is related with the uh, optimized system for uh, CO2 capture and uh, utilization using those uh, uh, guidelines of material design. And finally, uh, the possibility to use these tools also as uh, immersive, uh, as uh, out, out to reach pro projects where you have the combination of uh, immersive experiences of materials at a learning scale that can be used for uh, everyone uh, around the world, in particular in Brazil. I think this is very important to emphasize the, uh, uh, the importance of science and also for the public to understand what you are doing. Uh, 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 and the, the potential that uh, our uh, project has to do with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Uh, in this way, you really can make this combination of uh, uh, very uh, interesting stra strategies with some uh, goals that can be uh, interesting or the uh, white. So with this, Lucian, sorry for this five minutes. I just want to finalize by thank you uh, all for attending this uh, this workshop, uh, for the opportunity to share uh, this with you, and also I would like to share, uh, to uh, to thank the uh, the funding agencies, particularly uh, some uh, uh, funding agencies in Brazil, FAPESP, CNPq, CAPS, in the University of São Paulo and also some projects that you have it with the industry. You know? uh, the particular the projects that I showed to you uh, do, for those uh, people, Daniela, Damasceno, Bruno Zonio, Alexandro uh, Kish, and Camilo Salvador. So with that, uh, thank you very much. So uh, just want to make advertise. So there are some opportunities if you are be interested in our group. And uh, with this, I think... Uh, I stop it here. Sorry uh, nice. again, Luciano. Thank you a lot. I, thank you. Thank you a lot. And uh, ah, if you, yeah, if you, if you uh, uh, want, you can keep your oh, okay. screen share it to, to the public. And so, thank you a lot for your very nice presentation. Uh, so uh, inspiring to us. Uh, because you are talking about uh, many different things and also about the social part that we need to have uh, inside the academic area. So this is uh, so important. Uh, we have time for questions and I can see here if uh, we have some questions from the YouTube channel. Uh, Unkit Carget, I guess, this is the spelling, uh, uh, asked, 
what are the properties required from DFT calculation to use in MD calculations then to finite element analysis, uh, also down to top approach, or what are the connecting properties in mood scale modeling? Sure. Well, uh, <clears throat> it, you have looked for two, uh, I mean, two classes of key properties here that uh, uh, we could make the coupling between first principles with uh, uh, a continuum model based on finite elements. I think the first one is related to the structure uh, in the sense of uh, to be able to figure out uh, which reg regime in temperature and pressure that you could get from the first principle calculations when you calculate the free energies. Uh, I don't have it here in the slides to show to you, but what you have done uh, on this paper was mainly uh, to do that, to be able to get uh, uh, how is the which, which regime in temperature and pressure, this will be uh, interesting. So when you, once that you know that, uh, one thing that uh, uh, you can get from the first principle calculations, uh, the fully, uh, you can describe fully the elastic in the mechanical properties, particularly the, uh, the elastic model I, the shear models, the Poisson ratio, the density that you can obtain by uh, this function theory, for instance. And those are the, those informations that uh, you have been able to uh, to couple with the finite elements. So uh, here the density, the Lange modulus, and the Poisson ratio with respect to the for a given temperature and pressure. You no. Know? So in this way, uh, what you could uh, add. You could add how does the system going to change uh, for a, for a given situation. You no, know? now you at finite elements you completely miss this atomic uh, atomic uh, view of the problem. However, you have the multi-physics uh, uh, included when you have the elastic properties of those system with respect to the temperature. This is something important. So. Uh, in a summary, the machine learning method allows us to search for the sweet, uh, sweet spot points where uh, you have an interesting potential interest comp composition. The first principle of calculation allows us to uh, obtain the stability, and not only that, also to obtain the elastic properties. And finally, you could add those elastic properties of materials that does not uh, exist yet on the finite elements. So I hope that I can, I could answer your question, but if not, please feel free to, uh, again, to-, to No, thank me. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just complementing uh, these questions from uh, the, the participant. The uh, yes. One, one challenge we have uh, on applying machine learning algorithms is ex exactly uh, due to the data set. Mm -hmm. uh, the large data set we need to have uh, for modeling. So, uh, thinking about that, uh, these kind of uh, properties from the DFT calculations and, you know, from the solid DFT calculations, uh, depending on the, the unit cell, depending on the system, depending on the method, we uh, spend a lot of time uh, it's time consuming to generate uh, the data set from the DFT. And uh, the uh, ML algorithm depends on the data set. So sure. you need to have a lot of data to model uh, correct the system and predict the properties. So I'd like to, to have a comment from you about this challenge because uh, uh, we need uh, we need to have a good data set for the ML algorithm. Yeah, okay. uh, this is completely, I mean, uh, I fully agree. Uh, in this way, let me see if I have it. Uh, uh, let me take the slide here. Now, what, uh, yeah, yeah. So basically, in our case, uh, you have to choose uh, the data, uh, the databases of the materials project, 
that is a very uh, standardized uh, at the same time uh, maybe one of the most uh, complete uh, in terms of uh, uh, information that you have from the first principle calculations so you basically use the information that was available there you know, and I fully agree that uh, of course uh, this uh, machine learning model is highly dependent of uh, your our database so this uh, this step should be done in a very uh, with care. Uh, however, one point uh, uh, that I, the, my message here is mainly what you're trying to do with the machine learning here is mainly to uh, accelerate the process to identify what would be good compositions that it could allow us to narrow down you know, in terms of possibilities. So it means that uh, even if you don't have the best of the model in, this, in terms of uh, to include it, all the information possible that is already uh, ongoing, you know, we could make the survey in a, uh, in a very fast uh, way. Now, then comes the this, this second step here, I mean, the third step, actually, that uh, once that I, I have this possible composition uh, range of uh, uh, possibilities, then you have to do the our uh, uh, standard DFT calculation. That is something that I can also contribute to uh, increase the, the, this data set. See, uh, here uh, you could map it with the machine learning very quickly this 10 area diagram. However, if you try to do this by first principle calculation, this, this could be very computational demand and also uh, take a longer time. However, uh, this uh, validation it should be done. It means that uh, you're not going to use the information that you have the own machine learning model directly on the finite elements, but uh, you have to check the stability and also if the elastic properties that has been uh, observed here is uh, uh, I mean, it's capture uh, as you you do the calculation by first principles. See, uh, so you're going to use this as a, a way to survey over a huge amount of possibilities. But uh, then I fully agree, and this is why uh, this this step is really uh, uh, a crucial step when you choose uh, this uh, this particular uh, um, when you try to do this kind of uh, uh, approach. And this is, was more or less what you try to do when you uh, make, try to narrow down in filtering some of the properties and something that you already know what you're looking for. That is uh, some elastic property that, that is in the range of the titanium alloys. So very specific for this uh, particular problem. But I agree that uh, uh, this is an uh, important issue and always you have to make it uh, to keep in mind that of course those calculations or those measurements have errors and uh, to check it out uh, how is the impact this is something that you have done for instance how is the impact of the error that you have in the elastic properties calculated by first principles on the finite element uh, simulations so uh, the propagation of the errors and how uh, uh, the sensibility of the errors, this is something that is also have to keep it, it should be done. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Caetano, even uh, 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 an, ans an answer here in, on YouTube channel uh, was uh, replied by uh, another uh, person. I I'd like to know from you uh, an answer for Safira Amer that's basically is asking you to talk a little bit more uh, about the base set that you use it, for example, for titanium, strontium, sure. and uh, uh, basically for other uh, transition methods. You can uh, answer uh, this. This particular, yeah, of course. So in this particular case, you have used it, uh, uh, the G GDA PDE, no, uh, again, uh, of course, for some systems of some specific, some issues that you may have it uh, from the uh, electronic point of view, particularly 
for some cases where uh, you have to deal with uh, localization and so on and so forth. Uh, for our case, uh, you are mainly interested on the structure and also the large properties. So for those systems, uh, sorry, for this for those properties, uh, this function in particular, they, it was very helpful for us. You know? I didn't give so much details here. For instance, one of the things that you have to uh, take care of is, is the way that are going to generate uh, uh, your supercells. And uh, here you uh, you have, since you deal with uh, alloy, then uh, this uh, there are some techniques that allow us to describe the system from the disorder point of view. This is more or less what you have uh, done here. But uh, again, for this particular application, uh, you have used the PBE, uh, but for some cases, may not be enough in order to describe it if you are interested mainly on the electronic uh, properties or, or localization, for instance. This. Thank you. Uh, okay, I, good. I yeah, because yeah, I, maybe I, if I, you wanna, uh, uh, of course, you, you can always, can uh, make it deeper in the sense that uh, here you have a, a compromise between uh, which, what you are looking for and to which properties and details you are looking for with what you can do in a um, quick way in the sense of, uh, of course, as, as rigorous as possible. However, uh, it may be better uh, approximations that you can uh, use it for the electronic point of view. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, stay on this slide, please. Uh, I, I guess I guess it's also important to clarify for um, the 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 public that base set is mainly used for, for example, gas phase calculations. Yes, and you did mm -hmm. oh, solve yeah. the so, calculations. Yeah, yes. So th yeah, yeah. This this is a case where. Uh, you are mainly talking about uh, uh, extended systems. No, it's a fully under periodic boundary conditions. Yeah. So you are describing an infinite system. Uh, yeah, event. exactly. So, and uh, here uh, you are using a supercell. Uh, yeah. In one, as I, I call attention about this, uh, uh, this part uh, in particular, because if you're talking about alloys in terms of the solid phase, uh, you uh, you have to consider that uh, the alloys can also be disordered. So how you're going to uh, because you have a ternary system. So how can you produce uh, supercells that are is representative for including disordering at the same time for giving composition. So this is something that is specifically for uh, this kind of uh, approach. In the uh, in our particular case has been done with uh, plane waves, no? uh, that is the code VASP, but you also have applied the same methodology for other problems uh, with the, the siesta, that is a localized base set, uh, as well the quantum espresso, that is also plane wave code. No? Okay. Your, observa you. your observations uh, is fundamental, Luciano. Yeah, Here yeah I know. About, uh, yeah, no, I know. Mm -hmm. I know. Uh, just a, a two uh, last questions uh, together, okay, uh, sure. from two users. Uh, uh, well, uh, we have here uh, one is: Can you suggest more database other than Matthew's project? And another one is: uh, If you have some good um, tech textbook, okay, about the CO two sequestration and conversion. Uh, one uh, uh, user uh, asked about this. About sure. this. Yeah, let me, uh, regarding to the, uh, the databases, uh, of course, there are several ones available. This depends on uh, your, uh, your, the problem that you are interested in. For instance, there are special ones for catalysis. They have a, uh, here, uh, the, the, I choose this because I have a very close uh, uh, relationship with the people that have developed this project. However, uh, in Europe, you have uh, the Marvel uh, initiative. You also have uh, the Nomad one uh, that is the European uh, uh, 
initiative on that. Uh, they are flow in US. The China have your own databases uh, that I, uh, I I aware about it. In the I think particularly I mean so far those databases are open. Uh, this is something that in our community uh, maybe I'm going to talk particularly for our case in Brazil. It would be interesting if you also could uh, take care about uh, the data that you generate, because uh, this is uh, very important, not only for the computation point of view, but also for the experimental point of view. So if you have this data uh, in a standard way, uh, it's very, uh, you have all these tools that can be used for, uh, for I mean, to really uh, take advantage of those techniques that has been uh, developed uh, in the previous years. Now, so if I go, if I would rank, I would go for the materials projects, the Nomad, the uh, the Marvel in the Switzerland, uh, the Afro uh, 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 in the U.S. and also the uh, the China uh, initiative. So maybe right. regarding to the uh, the book, uh, I make. May give it to you. I, I, I don't have it in the top of my mind. In a, uh, in a specific a, book, a specific yes. book, because uh, this is also an area that is uh, is involving uh, very data. fastly. Yeah. And uh, uh, I good maybe I, I give the same answer as the professor Zhang in the previous uh, uh, talk, that uh, you have several reviews that has uh, coming out uh, mm -hmm. recently. You see, this is a topic that uh, it was in the uh, COP26. I mean, it's, it's something that uh, uh, is really developing very fastly. And uh, uh, however, of course, it's the fundamentals, you have some uh, uh, ideas. That maybe uh, you could please write it to me and uh, I may think about some possibilities and share with you. Yeah. OK, thank you. Good. Put my email address here and yes. uh, feel free to uh, to remind yeah. me about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. And uh, as uh, Professor Caetano said, uh, he has an uh, open position in his group, okay? And uh, uh, anyone here interested to uh, uh, this position, please write to Professor Caetano Miranda, thank you a lot, Thanks Caetano, so much, for this uh, opportunity. The... Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I'm so happy, okay, to to have you here with us. I hope to see you soon. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, our uh, tomorrow session. We'll start at ten uh, four. Uh, Sorry, uh, we will start at uh, 11 a.m. Brazil time, okay? Uh, I hope to see you uh, tomorrow. Uh, thank you for each participant here. Bye-bye.